trust you with you know with their business. So, uh, and, you know, some of the basic things, again, you have no calls to action here, no phone numbers as we see, and you, you may want to put a map of where you are, some of your accomplishments. A one-page resume, if you will, is your home, should be your home page. This is going back to Bonobo's site. Okay. Um, Steve, I think we're open to take some questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Gabriel and John. Very interesting and compelling. Uh, I learned a lot myself. And uh, we've got some really great questions from the audience. Um, let's start by a simple one. How important is it to use video on our site? Oh, great question. Video is very engaging. Uh, people love videos, but here's the trick. Don't put a five-minute video. Uh, make the videos, if you could put the video on YouTube and link it to your site, that's great. It gives you inbound link credit, I believe. Uh, but your video should be short, sweet, and to the point. And if you could get videos of, let's say, in the service industry, of your executives talking, it helps build a relationship a, you know, with, uh, with your potential client who right now is judging you based on a site. So if you could have a 30-second to two-minute video tops, and you could have different videos addressing different things about your company. It really is a good sales point. So, uh, and you don't need a Hollywood type of video. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so there was a comment and a question regarding the Leaf Catcher website. Uh, and the comment is, isn't this also an example of a site that hasn't been re-optimized for all browsers? No maintenance. You're using Chrome, after all, third most popular browser. I think that brings up a, a really good question that will sort of cover this, which is, how do you optimize? For now that the world is being, you know, people are using three different types of browsers, sometimes more, um, how do you deal with that? Well, yeah, I mean, look, Chrome is picking up more and more of the uh, share market of the browsers, right? So more people begin to use Chrome. Uh, I'm using Firefox right now, and they have a respectable amount of users. I don't know what the latest figures are, but it's enough that if you build a website, you need to make sure it looks the same across Internet Explorer, Chrome, Safari for Macs, and Firefox. At least now, those four major ones. Now, moving right <laughs> along, along the same lines, um, a lot of folks are accessing websites now on their mobile devices. So what do you need to do for that? OK, let me first make a differentiation between a mobile site and an app. They are, uh, we find that sometimes we're confused between the two. Um, they are not the same thing. You could create a mobile version of your website, and that just requires to change the front end coding, the, ca the CSS, the cascading style sheets. And you could change the front end of your website to make it work on a phone. Uh, it is going to be a critical thing to do in two or three years from now, but uh, if you do it, it's great. You do not need to have an app for your business. Okay, so you know, putting the app aside, um, when you know people are constantly using their Blackberries or iPhones just to access websites, are there any best practices or suggestions that you can give folks to make yeah, sure that content can be read properly? Yeah, well, let's also discuss the iPad for a second because that's growing too. Sure. Uh, iPad's width is 980 pixels, so if your website is made to fit in an iPad. Um, that's great. They don't have to scroll horizontally. iPad is not considered mobile. It's not considered an iPhone or Blackberry. It's, it's like a computer iPad. So if your website's built properly to 980 width, it will fit in the iPad. In terms of mobile, it requires, you should have a mobile version of your website if people are looking for you online. An example could be if you're a restaurant. People search on their mobile devices all the time for restaurants and shows and things to do. But in the future, whether you're selling a product or a service, you should uh, have a separate uh, 
site for mobile, and that should be optimized for Google as well. So essentially, it's a separate website. It's not you can't just have one size fits all, or you shouldn't. No. The good thing about mobile site is you don't have to optimize one for the iPhone, then optimize one for the BlackBerry. It's not like an app. Like you have an app for the iPhone, it's not going to work for the Android. You got to make a separate one for the Android. A mobile app will work across uh, different mobile devices. A mobile, mobile site. site will do that. Yes. Right. Sorry. Okay. Um, Very good. So it's it's good to do that, especially if people are searching for your kind of business or, or service uh, on their mobile devices, and that is picking up steam. In fact, I heard from one research report that by the year 2015, 119 billion dollars will be spent through mobile devices uh, making purchases. That's 119 billion. Wow. Okay. Here's um. A specific question for you. Is it advisable to offer free registration, etc., to entice users to sign up? Okay, uh, good question. When do you have users sign up to receive a white paper versus just showing it to them? It depends how valuable the information is. Um, you can, if the information is, look, if you're targeting a niche audience about a certain subject, and you have very valuable information, they will go through the trouble of signing up for it. But if that's not the case, you might as well give it to them and make sure that you have your company and your company's information on that material because they will not take the trouble to sign up for it. And you will explain to them that they won't be solicited, you know, by the information will be given out to other people, other third parties. With the advent of social media, how do you social mediaize, if that's a word, uh, your site? How do you uh, organize your site and embrace new channels, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, etc., um, so that it's integrated with social media and people can participate with your website using social media? It's a good question. What we see a lot of sites doing is they just put a Facebook and a Twitter button somewhere. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make the, you know it's not that like the user doesn't have enough on their Facebook and Twitter. They come to you. <laughs> so what you want to do is let's. Because that's what they that's what they want to share. They want to share the picture of your product. They want to share the content you're providing them. Not your whole website, but a specific item on your website. So here on our blog we have something and you see then we have the whole Facebook and Twitter and all that great stuff. It's when you get to the actual content itself. So if you have a sale item, um, you have a special, let's say, product on sale give people the ability to share that particular item, not your whole website. I'm not saying you shouldn't do your whole site. I'm saying that's really, people don't bother with that. Great. Thank you. Do you recommend not using Flash because it's not supported by Apple products? Okay. Yeah, we get that question a lot. Uh, number one, if you do have Flash, make sure you have a script in there that pulls up J JavaScript or jQuery if the person doesn't have Flash enabled on their device. Do not tell the person you don't have Flash downloaded now. That's, people used to do that two years ago. It's not good anymore. They'll leave your site. As the question, should we use Flash, should we not use Flash, look, I don't think Flash is all evil. Um, I come from Flash design. If Flash could be fun, could be fun for games or anything, and it still has its purposes. But it depends on the business. But know this: if you must put a uh, a separate code in there that the user doesn't have Flash supported on their browser, or their firewall doesn't allow it to come into their company, that you could show them something else, a different image or jQuery that allows motion graphics. So there are alternatives if you want to use it. Thank you. Let's move on to an SEO question. With the competitiveness of SEO in various industries, 
how do you compete with websites that have been around for a long time and are highly optimized? What can you recommend to compete with them? What steps can you take, I guess, to get the best results? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, a lot of people coming to the web now who have ideas have the same concern, like, oh, wow, these other competitors have been around for years, and Google recognizes them. It's Google's job to show the user the best um, matches for their searches. Okay, so just because you've been around for a long time, you've been dominating the top of Google, doesn't mean you're going to stay there. So to compete with them, you need better content. You need better information, and you need to update it more frequently. So that's not easy to do. It requires time from your user's end to do. But again, uh, if you are going into a competitive landscape, like let's say you want to sell, um, let's bring up like that site again, Bonobos. Uh, if I go to Google and I go men's pants, Oops, and I spell it right. Bonobos is a relatively new site. They haven't been around for that many years. They've been around just for a few short ones, and they're going up against everything from a Target online to, you know, other sites like Amazon, and look, they're coming up on top. So just because you haven't been in the market uh, the longest has nothing to do with your ranking. You need to give better content. You need to have better quality of inbound links. Uh, Blue Fountain Media was not the first company uh, to do what it to come to the website industry, especially in SEO. And if I do website design company, we come up the first of all the companies. The reason for that is we spend a lot of time and energy writing content out there, uh, keeping our site fresh uh, and updated, and that takes a lot of effort. So. No, you shouldn't be intimidated by other <coughs> competitors that have been out there for a while. Just as a uh, quick uh, clarification here, there are three sites here who have paid a great deal of money to get that kind of placement. This is, if you look at our placement, which is the fourth, this is unpaid. This is based on the SEO work we did, not by paying our way there. So there's a real distinction. Right, and also this is pay-per-click. Notice we're also doing pay-per-click, but you know, because some people only click on the pay-per-click part, some people only click on the SEO, the optimized section part. Thank you. Now here's a specific question related to an industry. Is it advisable to make a web page as a medical doctor? And if so, are there any specific rules or things I should think about? Yes, because if you don't make a web page as a medical doctor, you're leaving yourself open to what other people have to say about you. Let me explain that. This is going back to what we talked about, online reputation management. If you have one unhappy patient that goes off the wheel and starts bad-mouthing your practice and, your, and who you are, and you have no online premise, presence, sorry, that means whatever that person says will go to the top of Google. So if you want to, you need to have that presence uh, on the web. You need to have, you need to talk about your services and who you are so you control your reputation online, number one. Number two, people hear about you, a lot of word of mouth. People go do research on who you are. If the first thing they want to know is if you have a website, they could see who you are, what you say about yourself. If you don't have a website, again, now they're going to go to your Facebook page, LinkedIn page, then they're going to read what other people read about you on Yelp and other places. You have to be active online. It's not a matter of comfort or, you know, I'm too old for that. No, you have to be because you will even lose those word of mouths if you don't, if you're not online. Going back to SEO, is there a best practice for using SEO and PPC together for an enhanced effort? Um, that's good. Is there a best practice for using both of them? Honestly, you got to measure results. You got to try PPC and C, for example. You sometimes what we do. Actually, we take that back. Sometimes what we do before we decide to do SEO for a keyword that means come up, you know, organically to that keyword. We have to put a lot of effort into that. We'll try it on PPC and see what kind of conversions we get. If we like the numbers we see, then we put the effort in doing SEO. You use the term coder and coding quite a bit. 
How do you feel about WordPress and or Squarespace type sites with specific themes and templates? I know you touched on it in some of the review of the examples, but obviously for small businesses, there's a lot of appeal from a cost perspective to using some of these template-oriented sites. Um, so are there situations where it makes sense to, to use that or to use that in conjunction with some other stuff? Sure. I think for first, first let's talk about what WordPress is. It's a content management system that enables users to control their fun and content through a user-friendly interface. And it's free to use. Um, it's open source, so it's very nice. And there's other ones, too, like Drupal. There's Joomla. Um, which one to use becomes a question of choice. Now, if you are a company that expects to sell, if you have thousands of products, WordPress is not the right choice, e-commerce choice for you. There's better solutions out there. But if you're a small business, like you're a doctor's site, you got one or two products you want to sell, WordPress is a great solution for that. And using the themes, yes, if you like a theme and it does a job for you, great. It's got a great library on the web. You can find all sorts of different um, designs and you know features. Is online support including online chat or just having standard email-based support uh, a good idea to have or not? And what um, recommendations would you have for someone who's looking to offer online support for their company? If you're going to have a chat feature on your site, make sure if the person uses it, they don't have to wait a long time to hear from someone because you'll lose them. People are very impatient. They expect that if they see chat now and they click it, someone will be immediately responding to them. So if you can't provide that kind of service, don't put the chat on your website. That's number one. Number two, uh, if you are going to put the chat there and the person's, no one's going to be there, certain, let's say, during certain hours or midnight, make sure you turn it off. It could disappear if you just say we're offline right now. Honestly, we, we, if you have the people to provide the customer service, then use it. If you don't, don't use it. It will backfire on you. What is the best way to use video on a website? Do you recommend using YouTube, Flash, other sites, other sources, other formats? Um, is there a best practice for video, um, or are there are a few ways to go about it? Yeah, there's a number of ways to go about video, but, the, but what I recommend to most companies is embed it from YouTube. Post it on YouTube. Um, people will find you on YouTube. They'll find it on your site. There's a lot of benefits to it. It's a lot simpler. It brings your costs low in terms of uh, bandwidth, in terms of storage space. Uh, it's just the best thing to do about it is to use YouTube for this kind of stuff. Do you ever see a conflict with the way the... YouTube embedding looks versus, I mean, you go through all this effort to have a beautiful website, it's professional, you have certain colors, you have certain styles and fonts and formats, and then you embed YouTube. Do you see a conflict with that from a design perspective at all? Uh, hold, I'm sorry. Oh, you can customize a YouTube format, what the YouTube uh, shows us. Oh, really? You don't have to stick with their standard. Yes, there are, you could customize it. So, and also, aside from customizing YouTube, look, let's say you have a video that you want to be very private. YouTube offers private channels as well that you could have. Now, here's another Google question. Um, when trying to optimize, how much time until Google acts on new content? What's the process or the... What's, I mean, obviously, uh, it's a pretty complex formula that Google uses for this type of stuff. But in general, can you sort of give us a behind the scenes? What goes on at Google when it comes to this type of stuff? And what are they looking for from a timing perspective and in, uh, in an opt optimization perspective? Sure. I mean, I would love to have uh, one of my marketing guys on the phone with me right now. But uh, I'll try to give the best answer that I know. Um, Number one, there's a few things. There's a few things you know about when doing on-site optimization. Um, when you do, th there are robots that do tell Google, and you can program them how often you want to tell Google that your page has been updated. Once that happens, 
the results will take anywhere from days to weeks depending on how competitive that keyword is on Google. But you should update also your title tags, your meta tags, you should update your header one tags in the page. Um, you should do interlinking within your site. And one thing everyone should know is that it doesn't matter if you link to somebody else, like doing an outbound link, you want to get a quality inbound link. When I say quality, you don't want to get an inbound link from a farm, uh, some site that will just link to anybody. You want to get a link from an eligible site, a site that talks about what you do, for example, like a blogging site. But you, you should change your content, and there are robots out all Google when you have. It's just how quickly will it show up? determines how competitive your landscape is. If I'm going after credit cards, it's, it's going to be quite a while. Sure. So not just changing your content, but also getting quality inbound links once you do is very important. From a budgeting perspective, I know the answer is dep it depends, um, but can you at least give us a range of what you need to budget to have a decent website that looks professional? Sure. Well, let's talk about what's involved in building a site because different companies could charge different amounts. We charge, you know, $125 an hour. Another company may charge more or less than we do. But the first thing is you need to plan out your site. You need to know how many pages do I have and what are the features on each page. Then you need someone to do a mock-up. That's the designs of your homepage and your sub-pages. That will determine, by the way, that look and feel is very important because people will judge you based on that. So don't just rush your mock-up and say, oh, just give me something cheap or a template. People are not dumb. They know it. And if they're determining whether to buy your product or buy your service and they think you took a cheap way out, they'll say, no, this guy's not serious about his site or her site. So design is very important. Again, this was demonstrated by Apple. Two, the coding. There's two types of coding. There's a front-end coding like HTML5, which is HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or Flash, or jQuery. And there is the back-end programming. That's when you have the database and such. Now, you could use a WordPress, and a simple five-page site could take anywhere from a week for someone to design really nicely or so for a few number of pages. Then it'll take somebody else another week and a half to just code it all. Uh, this is doing it from, you know, using a WordPress, almost from scratch with a WordPress. Obviously, if you're using a pre-existing template, it might take someone two days of work, but you'll see less results. I've learned something very valuable from learning with working big companies. They don't want the cheapest solution. They want the solution that will provide them the biggest bang for the buck. So rather than try and save on dollars and pennies, Ask yourself, what will I do that will give me the most number of leads, the most number of sales? Because that's why you're doing this. Um, sing, look, a professional site with no fancy functionality can take about three weeks with a team of one designer, a front encoder, and a back-end developer. A more complex site, something like the effects of Amazon, which, by the way, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars to build their site and test different things. A site like that takes an army. Facebook has 200 engineers on their staff working on the features and maintaining the site. So a lot of times people come to us and they say, I may have $100,000. I want to build the next Facebook with Tom. Yeah, that's great, but that's not enough for the team you need to hire for, something like that. Um, so it, it, does, it does depend. Uh, and it, but you should know that what your solution, you know, it's, it's really building a site has become a very complex art and requires a team. That's the thing I want you to understand. Is it requires a manager. It requires different disciplines to come together. If you have a complicated site, you need to hire an information architect to work alongside a marketing strategist to make sure the site they're building you is going to be optimized for Google, uh, it's planned out properly, they do the blueprint. You don't need to do that if you're doing a doctor's site. You just jump into mock-ups itself through a designer. Great, thank you. Uh, another SEO question. From an SEO perspective, should a company blog be housed on their site to get credit for the content, or is it okay to be host on, hosted on Tumblr, Blogspot, etc.? Well, you want to get inbound links to your site. That's what brings your site's credibility high. If your blog is on your site, and therefore the links are pointing to your site, it brings your site up higher on Google. Uh, so speaking you know, in general terms, it's better if your blog is on your site. But it's not necessarily an either-or proposition. 
uh, if you create great content on your site, it is attractive to a lot of other sites and can either be repurposed or picked up on other sites. So you will have it on your site and you'll be getting links from other sites. And sort of along the same lines in terms of using social media sites for business purposes, um, any advice or feedback on building a presence on Facebook, say, and how to create inbound links from Facebook to your site? An inbound link from Facebook to your site doesn't count as an inbound link. Google doesn't recognize it. But here's an important thing. If you Google people's names, their Facebook comes up right away. Google my name and my, and my Facebook is like the third or fourth one on the list. So what does that mean to you? That means that if someone is looking to work with your company and you're saying, here's your manager, here's your doctor, here's your attorney, they're going to Google their name and their Facebook will come up. So they should be careful what they're posting on their Facebook because it's pretty much public access. Right, but now you're seeing a lot of companies, you know, aside from the individual, they're having, you know, company presence and using the like button where, especially if you're a consumer product company or you're selling goods or not just services where someone could like a product, say, if you're an online retailer or something along right. those lines. Um, and uh, you know, that's becoming more and more popular. So is there an opportunity to sort of embrace this trend, which is going on with social media, as a way to get more traffic back to your site? Or do you need to just sort of exist in, in a lot of different places depending upon where your customers are? Okay, yeah, well, the, the first part was about getting an inbound link from Google, so, I'm sorry, from Facebook, and Facebook does not provide SEO value, but it can provide That's other, right. business other value. forms of marketing, yeah, business value. Sure. Um, remember, the goal of Facebook and Twitter and all these social media type of sites is to drive visitors to your site, not that you drive them to your Facebook, but they're vice versa. Mm -hmm. You want to get, you want to raise awareness on Facebook about your services, about your products, about your business, and then get the user to come to your site to take an action. You don't want to keep the user constantly just on Facebook. So you may want to uh, have a promotion on Facebook that you're doing, but have them go to your site to claim that promotion, as an example. I mean, one piece of advice is if you, no matter what social media site you platform you're using, be dedicated to it because you can turn people off if you have one post a month, uh, people are going to be turned off. They say you're not putting the effort in. If you have one tweet a month, people are going to be turned off. It's, it's keeping your visitors engaged, showing your company, having the conversation, and by being an active player, that creates confidence and gives you a much better chance of having them come back to your site. Yeah, and using social media marketing is tricky. I had a client that said to me, look, before they, when I first met him, he said, I have 90,000 Facebook fans. I posted an incredible sale and nobody bought from us. I want to find out why. Well, of that 90%, this person's business located in New York City, almost very few of them were in New York. Most of them were in other countries even. So they couldn't claim the award of 50% off in our store. You're not going to fly from Europe to New York to get 50% off his store. So just getting fans on Facebook or a Twitter following is, is not the end all. You want to make sure, A, that you, you know where your users are, how to target them, and don't bombard them with things that are useless to them. If, if I'm following a company in, let's say, Europe, because I may like some of the things they have, I don't want to constantly be advertised to by them. Sure. I want to be given valuable information. What we do is we share information with our, through our news that are about the newest you know, online ways to uh, market yourself, best design practices. We don't just bombard you with saying, oh, this week we're going to give a promotion out or, or you know, we're going to give you a newsletter. No, we don't do that. Uh, what we do is we give them valuable information to help their business. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure we can keep going on and on, but we've run out of our hour. It's been a very informative discussion. Uh, we're happy to say that um, we will provide a free download of the entire recording. Everything that you've seen and heard, all the questions that were asked will be included. Uh, you'll be able to get that at bluefountainmedia.com or bdionline.com, which is our website, either one. Um, 
Thank you very much, Gabriel Shaulian, CEO and founder of Blue Fountain Media, and John Gelberg, Chief Content Officer of Blue Fountain Media. It's been a pleasure having you uh, with us today. And thank you, all of the attendees, uh, for participating in all your great questions. Uh, we hope to see you soon, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.